Recording in progress. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Why don't we kick this off? Uh, welcome to our third uh, session on AB 1185. Welcome. I want to thank everyone for joining on a Saturday morning. Uh, for those of you who joined on Tuesday and or Thursday, welcome back. And I want to start by thanking the people who have reached out to my office to express their thoughts on these issues. As I've shared, I believe the question we have before us is not if, but how we promote ongoing community dialogue, equity, accountability, and trust. One key issue that has been brought to my attention is the need to slow this process down to ensure more voices can be heard and considered. And I wanna let everyone know again, I support that recommendation. <clears throat> the Board of Supervisors allocated $150,000 to support this work. We need to be deliberate, but not delayed in our approach. I'm here today to listen to the community and work on behalf of the community to better define what civilian oversight looks like in Marin. I believe a civilian oversight board and inspector general with subpoena power would allow greater continuity in communication and more opportunity to discuss issues, take proactive steps to align community values and law enforcement practices, address systemic inequities, and develop a better understanding on what public, po public safety means, particularly for our communities of color. In fact, civilian oversight is a best practice and community needs have to be uh, front and center at the table. I want to be clear that this is not intended to be punitive toward anyone. I believe that civic dialogue needs to, uh, leads to better policy and that AB 1185 offers a means for that dialogue. Given the swearing in of a new sheriff, the persuasive grand jury report, and the ongoing requests from the community for AB 1185 community oversight. The time is now. I look forward to this uh, morning's conversation, uh, although I may need to leave a little bit early. My aide Gustavo uh, will be here throughout. And the ongoing work with the community to better understand how AB 1185 should be structured in Moran. Again, thank you, and I'm going to turn it over at this time to Jamila. Thank you so much, Supervisor Connolly, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Before we go any further, we want to take a moment and include our interpretation features here today for anyone who would like to take advantage of those. So there's a slideshow that indicates what you can do, and we also have some audio. audio. Instructions for accessing interpretation through Zoom. One, click interpretation. Two, choose a language. Three, click mute original audio. Instrucciones para acceder a la interpretación en español a través de Zoom. Haga clic en la palabra interpretación. Escoja su idioma. Haga clic en la palabra Mute original audio. Hướng dẫn truy cập phiên dịch tiếng Việt qua Zoom. Bước 1. Ở cuối màn hình thu phóng, nhấp vào diễn giải. Bước thứ 2. Chọn ngôn ngữ. Bước thứ 3. Nhấp vào mute original audio. Great, thank you so much. And I want to give Under Sheriff Moyer an opportunity to share a few welcome and opening remarks as well. Super Under Sheriff. Thanks, Jamila, and thank you, uh, Supervisor Connolly. I'm Sylvie Moyer, and I serve as the Under Sheriff, and I am here on behalf of our Sheriff, Jamie Scardina. We remain individually and organizationally committed and eager 
to hear from our community to define and and really lay out uh, a path forward for sheriff's oversight. We are here to listen. We are here to provide space for everyone in our county to speak, to help frame this very important work so that we can move forward to strengthen our relationships and the way that we provide exemplary and professional, inclusive and human frontline law enforcement and safety service in our county. So I am here to listen. And on behalf of our sheriff, thank you for including us and giving us a seat at the table to be beside you in this really important work. Thanks, Jamila. Thank you so much, Under Sheriff. And with that, everyone, we want to, again, welcome you all to today's conversation. We know you could be anywhere. We appreciate you being here with us for the next two hours. And just before I turn it over to our facilitator, Brian Kaur, wanted to mention again that we do have interpretation happening. Um, and so we're going to ask people to speak a little bit more slowly uh, so that we can make sure that everybody can um, hear and participate and, and be a part of this. And so with that, excited to turn it over to Brian Kaur, our facilitator from Nicole. And Brian, take it away, please. All right. Thank you, Jamila. Uh, thank you to everyone for being here today. Again, my name is Brian Kaur. I'm a past president of NACOL, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. And my uh, day job is that I work in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I am responsible for civilian oversight of our police department. And I want to start by acknowledging that um, I am speaking to you today from the unceded lands of the Narragansett, Poakanoit, and Nipmuc peoples. Um, if you've been to one of these before, I live in Massachusetts, but today I'm in what we call Rhode Island. And so I always think it's important to acknowledge uh, whose land we sit and stand on. And I know that for those of you in Marin County, you are on the land of the Coast Miwok people who occupied and stewarded those lands for thousands of years before non-Indigenous people removed them from their land. So let us acknowledge that and that sense of place um, that we have that's so important to us. Know that there are others who walk these lands before us and who um, survive today despite the injustices that have happened. Um, next, I want to say a little bit about um, what we're doing and then I'll just launch in. So I'm going to start by sharing uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I'll be using um, because I'm going to be providing some information as well as then facilitating what we're really here for is a listening session. And I, I again want to acknowledge that we're here because the County of Marin, the Board of Supervisors has launched this initiative. County staff, Jamil and her colleagues have been supporting it. Uh, the C Human Rights Commission for Marin County has played an important role all the way through. And then of course, NACOL, we are supporting this effort. Uh, we are technically acting as consultants, but I like to think of us as partners in supporting communities as they create and develop civilian oversight that will be effective in their community. So this conversation, uh, Sheriff Oversight in Marin County is designed to do a couple of things. Uh, but before we do it, we have to um, have a sense of how we want to do that. So these are some um, conversation norms, meeting agreements that I hope everyone can support and uh, will work for all of you. So I will go through these since we have translation. Um, I know for some people you can just read the screen, but we want this to be a space to learn and to contribute so that everybody here in this space can do both. So we ask that one person speak at a time and we have the raise hand function in Zoom where people can raise their hands. You can also use the chat to put comments or questions in. Um, we found that these are a combination of quest a combination of questions and comments. We ask people to make space and take space. Um, sometimes you hear that as step up, step back. And what we really mean is that for those of us who the way I am, can um, tend to speak freely, take up a bit more space in meetings. We ask you to step back and make sure that others have a chance to speak. And I may, in facilitating, even you know, skip around a little bit just to ensure that people who haven't had a chance to speak can speak before others um, speak again. 
But if you are someone who hangs back, please, you know, take a little bit of a risk and speak up. Uh, again, you can use the chat function if you don't feel comfortable speaking on camera, but we would love to hear your voice or at least um, read your words. We ask that people use I statements and speak for yourselves and not for others. Um, I understand, I think we hope we all understand that there are people whose voices are not often heard, who may feel less free to speak, um, we feel that they haven't been listened to. And we also ask that people not try to speak on behalf of others and speak for others' experience, but really speak for themselves and their own experience. Um, as I mentioned, we want this to be a learning space. And so we ask people to be learning together and open to learning. Um, I think that all of us will hear things that we may not know, we may disagree with, we may have thought differently about. And we ask people just to be open and engage with that. Um, not come in so much with a critical mind, but with a, a listening mind and an open heart. We ask that people are aware of power dynamics. There are many dimensions of identity, of power, of privilege. And I think that many of us, like myself included, tend to focus on where we lack power, where we feel that we're marginalized. And I ask us to just make a special effort to remember where we have power. And so that can help us as we have the conversation and help us to treat each other with respect and dignity. Um, as I mentioned already, there's the chat function that you can use to share comments in your own words. And we do ask people lean into discomfort while being respectful of others. And just know that, again, people have different experiences, different backgrounds, different identities. And we never know what someone else's lived experience is, what their background is. So be respectful and, and thoughtful and kind as you share your comments. Um, and then the last thing on the list is to accept, expect, and accept non-closure. This is a process. Uh, it's not starting today. It's not ending today. And so things will continue to evolve. I know in other sessions, people have asked questions about the process and what's going to be the result and how do people know the result is going to be good. This is part of the process. This is helping NACOL and the county, uh, the board of supervisors and the working group, um, which I will talk about in a moment as well, to continue to shape the process and reshape the process. Um, changes have already been made based on the feedback to lengthen the process and ensure that voices are heard from all parts of the county, um, all backgrounds, all walks of life. So it's a long way of saying that this is not the be all and end all. So there will not be at the end of this a determination of what happens next with a big plan. This is part of creating that plan. So that was a lot. <laughs> so, um, you take a breath and tell you about what we plan to do today specifically. So my role is to provide some background and context, a little bit about the community engagement work that's happened to date around this um, and the AB 1185 working group. Then a bit about AB 1185, Assembly Bill 1185, which is now part of the state law that allows counties to create oversight of their sheriff's department. And generally about the work of civilian oversight. Um, NACOL, as a, the National Association, has worked with communities that are all over the country and internationally. And we have a lot of experience and ideas and thoughts to help the county of Marin and all of you who live there shape what civilian oversight will look like in your context. Uh, we'll talk a bit about challenges and opportunities, and then the bulk of the time today will be spent on listening to your experiences and ideas. Uh, we certainly, again, happy to answer questions to the extent possible, really about oversight in the process, but then we want to hear from all of you. That's why we're here. And know, again, that you've got elected officials and their staff, um, people from the sheriff's office, people from the county government, and NACOL, all here to listen. And so your voices are, excuse me, very important. So framing this conversation. As I mentioned in the agenda review, there has been a process that's started and is ongoing around community engagement. 
Um, first, there are these three initial community conversations. Uh, this is the third of three. We're doing them on Zoom in order to have this initial engagement, let people know what has been happening about civilian oversight, and then to listen, as I've said a couple of times today. Uh, our next phase is going to be doing surveys, digital and paper, so that there are multiple methods for people to engage and that we in this process can hear from as many people as possible. Um, Nicole is working with a couple of people that are experts in creating these kind of community surveys. And then um, that, it, that is being drafted. It will go through the AB 1185 working group, which is the entity that is uh, responsible for moving this process forward and bringing forward a propo specific proposal for civilian oversight to the County Board of Supervisors. Um, and this AB 1185 Community Outreach Working Group um, has already been working to promote this process. Um, they're, this is part of starting to conduct outreach. And then they are, again, already providing feedback as this work is going on. Um, it's a diverse group of people that was uh, chosen by the Board of Supervisors, I'm sorry, by the Human Rights Commission uh, from people who applied from all over the county. And um, this working group is working with NACOL, working with Jamila and staff at the county to, um, again, ensure this process is open and transparent, but really results in a proposal that represents the type of civilian oversight that will be effective for Marin County and works for the communities of Marin County. And so the, the next step is going to be um, after the surveys, doing focus groups. And again, that's in development. So part of what we wanna to hear today, hopefully, are your thoughts and ideas about how to do that outreach, the best ways to reach those who are not as, common, as commonly heard from, who are not as likely to fill out a survey or get on Zoom or maybe show up at a community forum. Um, or work. So we really hope that um, this conversation today is the last two will help us hone in on the best ways to uh, do focus groups, do outreach, and hear from all stakeholders about civilian oversight um, in Marin County. So I'm now going to shift a bit to providing a little background and information. And um, as I said, I live in Massachusetts. I'm an East Coaster. I've been doing work in California through NACOL and independently, but I'm not an expert on California law. However, um, this bill, Assembly Bill 1185, was groundbreaking um, and people across the nation have been paying attention because it authorizes each county in the state of California to create uh, either it or um, and or a sheriff oversight board and or an office of the inspector general. And that can be done either by the board of supervisors or the residents of the county can vote directly to create civilian oversight of sheriff's departments. Um, it's something that there are a few places around the country that have it. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a bit, but um, it's not very common. And so it's very exciting. And again, people were watching to see how this develops across California. Uh, this bill, this law, gives the chair of the sheriff oversight board and an inspector general the power to issue a subpoena, uh, which is a subpoena you know, calling for a person to come in and provide testimony, or a subpoena ducis tecum, which is a subpoena for documents, for materials, um, whenever it's necessary for their work. And again, that's an important thing to note that these subpoena, um, subpoena powers are not universal in civilian oversight. We'll, I'll say a little bit more about that later. And that this was added to the government code, the state laws of California in November, 2020. So this is, again, it's in the law. It, there are counties across the state of California that are working to create this. And Marin County is in the forefront of doing that work. So I want to say more about what civilian oversight can look like in Marin County based on um, Assembly Bill 1185. So the government code that this has been put into, I won't read the number, um, outlines the structure of an oversight board or committee. So it has a specific purpose, which is to assist the board of supervisors 
with its duties that are required under the law that relate to the sheriff. And the, the way I like to think about this is that the Board of Supervisors has certain responsibilities, but they have a huge range of responsibilities to for the entire county, for all aspects of government. And so having an oversight board or committee allows you to have a group of people who can receive specific training and be more focused on the issues of law enforcement and the sheriff's office in the county. Um, it goes on to say that the members of the sheriff oversight board shall be appointed by the board of supervisors. It's composed or comprised of civilians um, and this comes up a lot, and I often think about this. Civilian is a term that often gets used around things with law enforcement to mean, as it says on the slide, not sworn or not law enforcement personnel. Um, there are challenges with that terminology, but that's the common terminology, as we say, civilian oversight. So the oversight board is composed of civilians, not law enforcement personnel or sworn officers. And when the Board of Supervisors creates this, it serves, it designates one person to serve as chair of the board. And that chair has the ability and will issue a subpoena or a subpoena deuces take them whenever the board deems it necessary or important to do one of three things. Um, when they need to bring in a person as a witness on any subject matter that's within the board's jurisdiction, within the, the scope of the board's work. They can use it to bring in any officer of the county in relation to the discharge of their official duties on behalf of the sheriff's department. So basically anything about their official work um, as part of the sheriff's department. And it can be used to bring in any books, papers, documents um, that are in the possession of or under the control of a person or officer that relates to the affairs of the sheriff's department. Again, very specific legalese, but that um, this subpoena can be used to get any necessary documents, papers, et cetera, that um, are under control of the sheriff's office that are needed for the work. And there's a mechanism, a way to um, ensure that this happens, that the superior court um, enforces these subpoenas. So um, there's, there's really a way if unfortunately someone were not cooperative to force them, to compel them to comply with the subpoena. So that's if there's an oversight board. Um, and the things about these oversight boards or committees that you might want to know just briefly is that um, it's what we tend to call the review focus model. There are three broad models of civilian oversight, review focus, investigative focus when the there's an agency with investigative staff that usually happens in larger cities and there are auditor monitor inspector general models um, that i'll talk about in a bit and often these days we see hybrids where communities are creating um, different aspects in either a single agency or multiple oversight entities so so a board or commission falls under what we call the review focus model. Um, it has some good advantages. It gives the community the ability to be involved in the complaint process. Um, sometimes that can mean something um, like taking complaints as opposed to people having to go to the department um, that they have a complaint about and file a complaint directly with that department. Um, it gives the community the ability to provide input into the complaint investigation process through um, an, an oversight committee or board. And that kind of community review of investigations can very often increase public trust in the process, knowing that um, there are people outside the law enforcement agency that are looking at and reviewing these investigations. But it also provides um, a way that community engagement becomes more meaningful. Um, that involvement is not just coming to a public meeting and speaking or sending a letter to the editor. It really is about people, as I've said, who've been appointed um, to get training and who have a singular specific focus on this work. And on the slide, there's a picture of the Los Angeles County Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, they ha have existed before this new state law and uh, they have some challenges in Los Angeles County, but they have been doing uh, some very hard work and are already making a difference in um, improving um, 
you know, the provision of both law enforcement policing, but also correctional services um, and in the county of Los Angeles. So the other model that you can look at through AB 1185, the other model that's authorized for created, creation is an inspector general. So an inspector general, as is in the code, um, also assists the board of supervisors with its duties that relate to the sheriff, as I've talked about. Um, this inspector general also has the same authority independently to issue a subpoena or a subpoena ducis tecum for documents and materials when for the same, again, exactly the same situation when it's necessary or important to examine one of those following three things, persons as witnesses, an officer of the county around their official duties with the sheriff's department, where those books, papers, or documents um, that are connected to the affairs of the sheriff's department, also enforceable by superior court action. And with inspector generals, inspectors general, excuse me, with inspectors general, um, you may be wondering how that fits into the scheme of oversight. So these inspectors general fall into what we call the auditor or monitor focused model. And these are instead of necessarily looking, say, at individual complaints or even policies and procedures, this generally, this model generally is looking more broadly at um, trends, at bigger patterns. And it often has more robust reporting practices because you're doing these broader reports than just about what happened in this specific incident with this complainant um, and this officer. It can really be a proactive way of promoting change because taking this long-term systemic uh, view can lead to long-term systemic change. Um, often people think about an incident and think, well, why did this officer do that? Sometimes it's because that's what the policy says. That's what officers are trained to do. And so the officer followed what they were supposed to do, but the result is not what the community is looking for. And so this type of model can play an important role in looking more broadly at what are the needs, concerns of the community? What are the issues that have come up? Where have been, there have been problems, especially repeated problems? and then allow the agency to um, be engaged in all those steps from um, the complaint process to looking at policies to making broader recommendations. So the, um, you know, they have different focuses. They often are put in place for different reasons in different communities, but it's important to know that um, there is no one best model. There's no um, ideal model that everybody should do but you have to find models that work for your community. And that's part of why it's very good that um, Assembly Bill 1185 gave communities the option of either, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> I thought we slow down, of either doing um, one, the auditor model or the inspector, gen or the, um, sorry, the inspector general model or the oversight board model. Alternately, they can do both. So that's one of the things that this process will lead to is considering and thinking about what is the best model? Is it one, is it the other, is it a combination of both? So there's a lot to think about. I'm gonna move ahead because I'm watching the time. Um, legitimacy is something that we talk a lot about in civilian oversight. And we talk a lot about in the world of law enforcement these days. Um, there was a task force that was put together by uh, President, then President Obama, um, which I won't go into the details, but it brought together a range of stakeholders from um, activists from Black Lives Matter to nationally renowned police chiefs to academics to community members in the effort to look at what do we think policing and law enforcement should look like in the 21st century. So this 21st century task force on policing did a number of things and it created a, a report and implementation guide that um, is still available. And I recommend to people who are thinking about these issues. But one of the topics that they focused on, there were six pillars and one of the six pillars was legitimacy and procedural justice. And so legitimacy can mean many things, but in this context, in law enforcement, legitimacy means the belief that the police, the law enforcement agency are trustworthy, that they're honest, 
They're concerned about the well-being of the people they deal with, of the communities they serve. That people, when they feel that the uh, law enforcement agency is legitimate, will think that they should accept the authority of that agency. So if an officer asks you to do something, well, I think these people are doing it for legitimate reasons. Let me comply and let me accept those decisions and follow their instructions. And then it, pr it provides the sense that people ought to comply with the law and cooperate with the police, not because they have to, but because they think that it's legitimate. So these concepts are equally important in the work of civilian oversight. And it's the same principles because civilian oversight, as I've mentioned, in California around sheriff's departments is a creature of the law, right? There's a law that allows counties and communities to establish this. So you can depend on the law says this and the law says that. However, what we found is for oversight to be truly effective, there needs to be legitimacy for the oversight work as well. So that everyone, um, community members, people with complaints, uh, people from the law enforcement agency, officers or deputies who may be um, accused of something, all feel that they are treated with dignity and respect that uh, same thing, I won't read them over again, but trustworthiness, um, that oversight is legitimate and you should cooperate and comply with oversight, that its recommendations and decisions are important and are legitimate and come from a basis of concern and care as opposed to a basis of power over or control. I mean, there are certainly places in the country where there have been egregious issues and things have to start with that kind of power and control. Um, however, in most communities, there are longstanding issues that are not simply about that county, but about our society that can be improved um, collaboratively with work from oversight supporting that and helping the community to channel those efforts. So as I, I kind of get to the close to the end of my uh, educational session, and, and I should just say, I meant to say that part of why I'm doing this on the front end is so people have a common basis of knowledge. I mean, this is not an in-depth training. We, we do these trainings over many days for people who are coming into this on oversight boards and oversight staff, but, but just to give people a bit of context so that as we, we start listening to each other and as those of us who are here specifically to listen, um, listen to you, we all have some similar context about what oversight is. So thinking about um, challenges and opportunities for Marin County, and this is how I, I hope we can frame um, the discussion. Um, again, I'm sure that people have some questions about oversight, but our goal is really to uh, answer those to the extent we can, but really to, to hear from you. So as we think about challenges and opportunities, we have these questions. Um, what are your expectations for civilian oversight in Marin County? And um, again, we really just want to hear from you. So it could be, you might have very specific thoughts. You might have very general expectations and hopes for what civilian oversight can accomplish in Marin. Um, what problems do you want to address? What are the things that you've seen? What are your experiences with law enforcement? Uh, what are you aware of from your work, um, from how you live? What problems do you wanna see civilian oversight address? What do you want oversight to look like? Um, again, I talked about the structures that are possible under AB 1185, um, but within that, there's a huge range of focus, of engagement, of the kinds of people you're hoping will be part of an oversight board, of the ways that that uh, oversight board will engage with the community once it's established. And I think perhaps most importantly, perhaps, what information do you think we need to know as we move forward with this process? So again, um, NACOL, uh, staff from the county, the AB 1185 working group, and um, the Board of Supervisors and the Human Rights Commission. What do we need to know? What do you think we need to know as we move forward with this process of building a model? And then I believe your county will adopt civilian oversight. Um, so that is uh, my slide presentation. 
And this is where I have the disadvantage of uh, not having um, <laughs> when I have it, my screens at work. So I'm going to leave this up for just a moment. And these, but I know we'll put these questions into the chat. And um, let's see. I think that at this point we want to go ahead and um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can actually see more people. And I am just going to open it up. Um, I see some comments coming up in the chat. And um, let's see. There's, it looks like there's a question from Edward Rusky. So now uh, about the um, people I think who can be on an oversight board. If the question is retired or former sworn or law enforcement personnel. And I'm assuming that means because I didn't see when it came in. Are retired or former sworn or law enforcement personnel allowed to be on the oversight board? Now, I don't, this is where I have the disadvantage of not being in California. Um, I, I don't know, it varies in different places. Um, maybe there's someone who knows who could stick something in the chat. Um, but it, many places have said that um, it's important not to have anyone affiliated with oversight with um, law enforcement involved in an oversight board. Um, other places say that you have to have somebody. My personal opinion, um, I'll just say, is that I think that it can be very valuable. Um, you have a number of people on the board, so you certainly don't want a majority of people all coming out of law enforcement. But having someone or a couple of people in a larger group who have that experience, who can talk about what they've seen, who can um, and see things from that perspective as part of a deliberative process can be helpful. And I know that in many oversight boards, having those people at the table um, has not been something to um, sort of unfairly bias the process, but to widen the perspective, widen the perspectives and help people have information they might not otherwise have. Um, and so now I see that Edward has raised their hand. So um, Edward, if you want to unmute, um, I'm assuming you have, you want to add or explain or ask a follow-up question. Oh. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, there's something going on with your sound. I, I won't even try to explain. Um, I. Well, we try one more time, but it's I, I can't even describe it. Um, but, okay. I guess um, I think I think Edward has has dropped off and we'll maybe try to get back on again. So, all right. So the floor is open. Uh, I would love to hear um, questions, but really, what I'd really love to hear, I think all of us would love to hear, is your thoughts. Um, again, in the chat, um, Jamila has placed the questions. What are your expectations for civilian oversight? in Marin County? What problems do you want to address? What do you want oversight to look like? And what information do you think that we need to know as we move forward with this process? Okay, I think Edward is uh, trying to raise their hand again. So um, Edward, if you want to try to unmute, let's see how it goes. Okay, uh, you look like you're unmuted, Edward. Thank you. Uh, can you understand yeah. me now? Yes, I, yes, I, I, I did want to say, but it reminded me of the chipmunks. If, yes. Uh, uh, if you're I'm, old enough I'm to a, remember them. I'm accused of being a chipmunk all the time, yes. Um, <laughs> I, I like to be Alvin, but I, who knows? Anyway, uh, the reason for my question is that I think what you'll learn as people begin to speak is that a large segment of the community starts out with feeling that the authority or the way in which the authority that the sheriff's office has uh, exercises authority um, is illegitimate. I think you, you, you don't start from, a, a, at this point, an even playing field. I think you'll learn, at least mm -hmm. with respect to much of the community. Um, and for example, there's a, a very severe uh, uh, event that happened in San Rafael, one of the communities in our county uh, that uh, 
the investigation is being led by a former policeman. And the community just threw up its hands at that point. Regardless of, we know nothing about this policeman. Maybe he or she is outstanding and be fair, but it already, it starts with that kind of uh, negative perception by some of the community. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an ex both an answer to what I was meant and also what I think you'll learn from the community. All right. Well, well, thank you, Edward. Uh, and again, you know, this is important information. Um, you know, we're we're still early in the, the stages of this, but as the um, the working group works to create a proposal, I mean, these are the kinds of things that um, are important to know. That you know, and and hear from different people about those perspectives. As I, as I said, you can make kind of abstract arguments either for or against having someone from law enforcement, but you have to do what works in your specific context. Uh, so that's that's really helpful. So thank you, Edward. So just waiting for more hands or more comments in the chat. Okay, I see Edward. Uh, Edward is, uh, I think, technically quapping, but I'm thinking that may be another hand raise, Edward. Yes, that, that was not meant to be clapping necessarily. <laughs> um, I'm just, I apologize for being, taking up all the time that everybody else has, but I'm hoping that other people will join in as well. Um, but one of the questions I, one of, only one of the questions I have is, um, or two. One is, does the oversight board have any view into the internal workings of the department and whether or not there are good or bad things that uh, affect the actions of the sheriff's department overall as it interacts with the community? That's question number one. Number two is, um, is there a place that we can learn more about those three or two possibilities of uh, the way in which we set up an oversight board or um, I didn't write down the other option, but uh, that you explained briefly, but is there a way to learn more about that? Okay, let's see, let's see if I can do all this. Uh, I think with the first part, um, again, I'm not an expert on the specific legislation. Um, I have a colleague who works for NACOL, Cameron McElhenney, who's not able to be here today, but she's been really working directly and she could answer that question. Um, what I guess I'll say a little more in the abstract is that, um, you know, that can, many forms of oversight do. I would think that this form would with an oversight board, certainly an inspector general, that's the other model. And again, Marin County could do a combination with both models. An inspector general would have that ability to look more deeply into the department, policies, procedures, practices. So it's not just complaint driven, but it really is driven by more systemic review and understanding of what's happening inside a law enforcement agency, and then being able to make um, recommendations um, for changes. And so um, I think that that, again, so that's going to be up to what um, gets proposed by the working group and then what the board of supervisors um, would ultimately adopt. The other piece is, um, I don't know if there's specific resources about 1185, Assembly Bill 1185 and the parameters for that, but more generally, um, NACOL, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, um, our website is nacol.org. Um, uh, maybe I could even put that in the chat, www. Nacol.org. And um, I forgot to put HTTP, you can't click on it, but um, there's tons of information there, but there's also a lot of information specifically about the different models of oversight. Um, there's also a report that Nacol did about effective practices in civilian oversight. And that report is on, is on the website, as well as the executive summary, which is a little easier to read. And in there, among other things, it talks about the different models and the benefits. I mean, that's part of what we're drawing on when we do these presentations to everybody. 
All right, you're you're welcome, Edward. Thank you. Thank you for the question. All right, so so far, I'm still not seeing anything new in the chat or any hands raised. Um, you know, I, as I said to people <laughs> last uh, the other day, I'm I'm comfortable with silence, but not everybody is. So, we'd love to hear other questions, other comments, other thoughts about what people are looking for. All right. Well, since since people are being extra quiet, let me let me try a slightly different approach. So I know there are people who have been to some of these sessions before, but I'd say especially if you haven't, but even if you have, maybe you could share in a, a couple of, a few sentences why you're here today. Um, maybe the prompts are not not inspiring you, but why did you take time on a Saturday morning to get on Zoom uh, and listen to a presentation and participate in a discussion? about civilian oversight. Okay, well, someone put a question in the chat. I think it, it came just to me, uh, maybe because I just chatted. So, but I will, I'll try to answer this. It was, um, uh, so Helen, I'm just going to say your name. <laughs> so Helen asked, I love what Nicole does, but do you have the resources to handle Marin, given that you have limited staffing? Uh, no, that's a great question. And so, yes, our staff is small but mighty. We have our uh, full-time director of training and education, Cameron McElhenney, our full-time director of operations, and Karen Williams, who's actually on this call, uh, is working um, part-time with Nicole to staff um, a whole bunch of different things. Karen is a former board member like myself. And um, so she has extensive experience and she also works um, in Kansas City for a civilian oversight agency. So, um, so the staff is not that huge, right? We have a lot to do. We organize an annual in-person conference, a virtual conference. We have a lot going on. Luckily, NACL also has a board of elective, 11 active members. Um, and then you have people like me who are past presidents that still do work with NACL, um, you know, and past board members like Karen. So we do have a small staff, but we, um, I think Cammy in particular is very good at pulling people in um, who have specific expertise and can um, support different efforts. So that's why we're able to work with communities around the country. And um, in fact, since, um, the murder of George Floyd in 2020, I believe 150 communities have reached out to NACOL. And so, um, yes, we, we, we do a lot. We're small but mighty, but we do have a pretty good set of people who are directly connected to NACOL who can help us out. And then there are also um, partners who are um, members of NACOL, uh, not board members, but involved in the organization and um, do work as well. So there's things like the OIR group based in Southern California um, that do work and work with NACOL um, to support communities around the country. So, okay. So I got a question answered. What else is there? Okay, so I'm gonna try again. So so I would love for just anyone to share why you're here.
Okay. Well, as I, I said the other day, I'm I'm a Quaker, so I, you know my my weekly worship on Sundays we sit there for an hour in silence mostly. So, but I won't impose that on other people. So I'll I'll talk a little bit more and hope that it draws someone to um, to speak up a little bit more. But one of the things that I think is very important as communities are creating oversight, um, as I've said a few times, is having all the stakeholders. And I will say that. Um, you know, I've certainly heard in these sessions critiques about the ability to hear from all stakeholders with the process that's been, been put in place. And um, again, I think people are really listening and working to continue to change that. But in the bigger picture, one of the things that can make oversight really effective is having that kind of engagement, not just at the creation, although you do need it from the beginning, but throughout the process. You need to have ways of listening to the community. Um, and that means everybody, not only the people who tend to come out for public meetings and make public comment, right, or the editor, not only those who are, are most impacted negatively by law enforcement, and the criminal legal system, and also um, not only, but also people who are working for law enforcement, people who are involved in law enforcement, uh, elected officials, public officials, everyone needs to have a seat at the table and everyone needs to have a voice. Now, I always say that one of the challenges in oversight is that uh, we have to remember why we're here and also be neutral and impartial in our work. And that's one of the things that can be challenging as well, because when there have been, as there are everywhere, um, negative incidents, sometimes horrible, even deadly incidents, there are a lot of problems that need to be addressed. And as oversight does its work, it's important that the oversight entity um, is aware of that history, knows where it came from, but also is impartial in its work, it's fair, and making decisions based on the information that it has and the facts and the cases. And sometimes that, that is challenging for people because people want the oversight agency to be an activist group, or they want the oversight agency to be an entity that is specifically speaking for certain communities. And that's not its role. Uh, there are others in the community, sometimes others in government. Um, you think about the Human Rights Commission and its specific role. So I say this, and maybe this will, will bring out a little conversation, but it's one of the, the very interesting challenges is the ongoing work to do community engagement, to hear and listen to all voices, to ensure that you're centering those who are most impacted while not um, being biased, uh, while you're being impartial and fair. Uh, it's, it's tricky business, but um, it's important. And that, that's part of why NACOL exists because it's not an easy role. And people really do need support and guidance and the ability to check in with other people from other communities and see how they've done things, how they've handled situations, how they've struck that, that right balance um, to fulfill their responsibilities. And at the same time, make sure that they have a legitimacy with everybody in the community. So that's a little, little few more thoughts from me. And now I'm going to invite others to speak again. What are your expectations? Why are you here? <laughs> I mean, now I'm starting to actually be curious. I'm personally curious to hear from people why you've joined this session. Well, maybe Ed, maybe Ed would be willing to speak. <laughs> I don't know. Not to put you on the spot, Ed, but. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, I guess the reason I'm here is that I think the Civilian Oversight Board is a fabulous concept. I think that uh, there are uh, police and sheriff are, and, law, other, and a lot of other whatever law enforcement agencies there are, inherently have a degree of power inherent in their job they carry guns and so there can automatically be distrust from somebody who approaches you uh, about that and that in and of itself isn't right i think that they 
that uh, there are people who would like the police disarmed, but nevertheless, there are people uh, who need that. Some people, there are certain circumstances that call for an enforcement agency such as this. And yet there is this friction all over, nation, county, cities, friction between communities and uh, the enforcement agency. And inherently, at least from my perspective, or not perspective, it's not accurate, what I've seen is that majority community, or what was once a majority community of white people, tend to have a far better relationship with law enforcement than minority disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities. And I have to believe that pattern, which is repeated all over, is there for a reason. I don't mean for a good reason, but there are causes for that. And I think the civilian, I would like to see a civilian oversight board soften those lines. Uh, whatever is uh, whatever is either real or not real uh, is brought out and discussed openly. And a, a, the, the, the barrier between law enforcement and civilians uh, gets softened in these communities. That's what I would like to see. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, thank you. Let's see, I see um, Annalise uh, has raised their hand. So um, I guess Annalise from KQED News. So um, please go ahead. Hi there, good morning. I just wanted to introduce myself and say hello. My name is Annalise, I'm a reporter from KQED News. I'm here today to learn a little bit about what Marin County is doing to develop civilian oversight and also to hear from the public. Um, so thank you, Brian, for your moderation, and it's nice to be here. All right, well, thank you. And uh, thank you for um, identifying yourself and letting people know that the media are here, which is great. Uh, it's really good that people uh, will have more opportunity to um, hear about what's happening. So thank you for being here. So let's see, there's a question in the chat that's come up. Um, can you give us examples of what positive and negative results you have seen? I said, this is for me. Um, this is, that is what, that is what has worked and what has not in the formation and operation of oversight committees and inspectors general. Um, so that's, no, that's a really great question. Um, there are a few different things that can really, um, make civilian oversight effective or can stand in the way of effectiveness. Um, and in fact, I mentioned that NACOL has uh, some reports on our website. These are reports that NACOL did um, after a two-year research project. We got funding from the Federal Department of Justice to examine um, a range of oversight agencies in in depth, I think nine different agencies, to do a broad survey of oversight and really with the idea of figuring out what makes civilian oversight effective? I'll say that people often talk about best practices in many fields. Because oversight is so diverse um, and there are about 225 oversight agencies existing right now, and they are in some of the, most of the largest cities in the country, but also smaller places. I'm currently working with Bennington, Vermont, which is a town of 15,000 people in a state with 600,000 people to create civilian oversight of their 24 person police department. And um, so it, it varies greatly. So what we found among other things is to try to answer your question is that there are 13 principles for effectiveness. They are not applicable in every oversight agency, again, because they vary so greatly. But some of the key ones are um, adequate funding and resources to meet your mandate. So again, oversight agencies have different roles, different functions. Um, some are, you know, say New York City, you've got investigators, um, over 100 who are reviewing body-worn camera footage and reports and interviewing witnesses and officers, um, they, they have a 
bigger budget, right? But one of the ways that civilian oversight has been made ineffective over the years is by not providing an adequate budget, not hiring enough staff, not giving them the tools they need. Um, that, has, that has been a challenge. And so there has to be political will to support oversight. It has to be in the budget. Um, some places have actually pegged the size of the budget of the oversight, of the oversight agency to that of the law enforcement agency. So not that it's under their budget or their budget is under control, but that it's set to a certain amount. So if the police department budget say is $10 million, the oversight agency's budget is $100,000, just you know, making it up, say 1% is a common number thrown out there to ensure that it has adequate resources. Another thing that I've seen, um, and this is probably the most common in the last few years, is that people will say the oversight agency has failed. And what has really happened is it's failed to meet expectations, often expectations that were not um, correct uh, because the expectations were for things that the oversight agency didn't have jurisdiction over or couldn't do, or the, the idea that civilian oversight alone could transform every aspect of a police department um, or change issues that are broadly um, existing throughout our society. So those are the kinds of things that from the beginning, it's important to lay out what the oversight agency can and will do, what its authority is, what its responsibilities are, what its mandate is, and also what it can't do. Um, and that, again, varies, obviously, depending on the model. So um, I'd say out of those 13 principles, those are the things that, that come to mind most immediately. There are lots of other things around community engagement and stakeholder support that are also really important. But those are more about the relationships and communication and reporting. And so it's and if people are doing that work well and building those relationships, I won't say those take care of themselves, but those are the things that, that allow success in some of those other areas of effectiveness. So that was a long answer. And I see some other things have happened in the chat. Um, okay, so this is a long question that, um, again, it came, you know what, I'm just gonna copy it into the, the chat myself because it was supposed to, it was, it's noted that it was meant for everyone. Uh, I, I think I can copy it. Can I do that? Yes. So, um, and now I'll read it. So I know that the chat doesn't work for everybody. Um, as a former Human Rights Commission member, I'm sorry, and this is from Helen Castile. As a former Human Rights Commission member, I am here to learn from county leaders, experts like yourself, and community members what a workable model under AB 1185 would look like in Marin. We all agree that there is a need for oversight, but differing opinions about what type of oversight. How do you ensure community input with the inspector general model where it's left in the hands of one person and staff? And what type of funding will be devoted? Okay, so I, I addressed some of this in just talking about funding. Again, that's a decision that each um, municipality, each county, each state, that has a form of oversight has to make in their budgetary decisions about how much funding, but you definitely wanna make sure it has the funding to meet its mandate and role. In terms of uh, community input with an inspector general, you know, there, again, there are different models. There are inspectors general that are very much kind of a traditional inspector general where, um, you know, you are doing performance audits and looking at data and um, not really looking at individual complaints. There are also inspectors general that do take individual complaints and have a process for either investigating or reviewing investigations by the internal affairs folks at a law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have that. You also can have um, community engagement through um, community forums, listening sessions, sort of what we're working on here. There are different ways to do that, even where you have an inspector general and no um, kind of community oversight board. But when you do have that board, um, and again, AB 11A5 lets you have both, um, either or both. Even with that board, it's important not to think that that board alone can provide the voices and experience of people. So that board needs to be working on 
community connection, on outreach, on listening, um, and finding ways to do that. I mean, part of why it's so important um, to do this kind of process on the front end is because you you need to start modeling that. You need to start listening to all those people and finding ways to do that, and then bringing that in to um, the whatever form of oversight is really created so that that continues. And it's not a trivial thing. I mean, it really does take time and it's not easy. Um, I think every community I've worked with, including my own community in Cambridge, Massachusetts, we're constantly challenged about how to do effective outreach and how to listen effectively to all parts of the community. Um, and it's it's something that there are, you know, people keep coming up with new ways. Zoom is great in certain ways. And a lot of times it really just involves working through trusted people, um, reaching out to community organizations, to clergy, um, to business associations, because sometimes people think that business people don't ever have complaints or problems with law enforcement, but they do as well. Um, and they can be all sorts of things. It can be needs for enforcement. It can be safety. It can be interactions with officers or deputies. So uh, it's important that that kind of outreach happened directly, but also that happens through trusted partners. And again, if it were um, something that we someone just knew how to do and did it well, they would be going around the country training everyone how to do it. And it's it's something that I think always needs work and always needs improvement. We're never going to get to the place where someone's figured out in any given community how to do engagement because it's always changing. Communities are changing, needs are changing. Um, you know, no matter where you are and where you live. So um, let me see, community, is I, hopefully I have answered that question <laughs> at least well enough to give, give a sense of uh, my thoughts on how to do effective community engagement um, and hear from the community, whether you have an inspector general or an oversight board. So, I guess I just wanted to ask if, um, I know we do have some members of the working group and the Human Rights Commission here, if there's anything um, any of you would like to ask or pose, um, I would say thank you, Helen. Because um, I don't want to just force us to sit here on Zoom until um, the end of the hour at noon if there really aren't things for people to share, but I really do want to hear. Well, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Nobody's coming off camera except for Jamila. Um, I don't know if Jamila's coming off camera with a question for me, but um, but in all seriousness, uh, you know, we've got this plan till noon, but we don't have to just sit here and stare at my smiling face, so. Well, Jamila, do you think that we should um, just start wrapping up and allow people to get half an hour of their morning back? I think based on um, the questions and comments coming in, Brian, um, that makes sense. And um, we can go ahead and move into the next steps that we have for, for people and um, then we can go ahead and close out. Okay. So let me share my screen briefly. Um, so uh, our next steps, uh, you know, we have, we've now gone through these three Zoom sessions. So we will now be working on the survey, which I mentioned. And 
Uh, we really want that survey to um, inform us, you know, with broad and wide input. So, you know, we hope that all of you will obviously fill out the survey, but spread it to your networks. Let people know about it. Um, you'll give them, you know, their paper surveys, they can do the QR code once it's done. Um, and we really want to make sure that people are engaged with this process. So originally, um, the, the process was to result in a proposal to the Board of Supervisors um, within a few weeks that has been extended. Uh, I know that the Board of Supervisors is very mindful of feedback that we've already received about um, the process being, you know, not given enough time. And it, it's one of those things, again, communities face this constantly because there's this tension between um, people feeling like things are happening now, people are suffering now, problems exist now, and we need to make change, we can't wait. And balancing that with having a deliberative process that really is inclusive, listens to all voices, takes the time it needs to take. And in every one of these processes, I've heard from people who on the one hand are concerned that nothing will ever happen, that we've talked about this for years and nothing ever changes. And people who are concerned that um, things are just being rammed through to get something done and we, we have to slow down. So we're committed to, in these next steps, taking the time we need to do it right and to hear from people and also moving forward to come to a conclusion so that uh, Marin County can adopt the form of civilian oversight that works for um, the people of your county and provides the kind of public and community safety that all of you are looking for and need and deserve. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen one more time. And um, as Jamila put in the chat, there is a website you can visit, um, marincounty.org slash main, M-A-I-N, slash sheriffs dash oversight dash committee. Um, again, that link is in the chat. Uh, it's on the website. And that is a place where you can both learn more now, but also keep track of the process as it develops. So again, I, I really want to thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, I want to thank the staff that are doing this on their weekend time. Although I know some staff work weekends regularly. I want to thank the volunteers on the uh, AB 11A5 working group for being here and listening, uh, members of the Human Rights Commission, and um, also uh, Karen from NACOL staff for um, helping make sure that we're capturing uh, what happened today. And then everybody who's doing the interpretation, the, the Zoom hosting, the sound, um, a lot of people have done a lot of work to make this possible. So um, I appreciate the commitment that the county um, administration and the people who live in Marin County have to this process. And just know that we will continue to accompany you on this path. Uh, this is really important what you're doing. As I, again, as I said before, uh, people from all over the country are watching what's happening in California. And um, it's great that you are doing this and engaged. So with that, thank you all. Really appreciate your time and look forward to continuing to engage as NACOL supports the county of Marin and the communities in the county in this process. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Jamila. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.